Glenn Pearson is a decent man. In fact, in 2008, McLean's magazine called Mr. Pearson the last decent man in Ottawa. However, what is remarkable about Glenn Pearson is not his decency in Ottawa. Rather, throughout his life, he has contributed to an ongoing project of decency, fairness, and activism, fostering local, national, and global causes that transcend the politics of Ottawa. For this life's work, he is a role model who truly deserves our recognition and praise. Glenn Pearson was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta. Before coming to London in the 1970s, he had worked in famine relief in Bangladesh and cooperative peace building in Ireland. A professional firefighter for almost 30 years, he co-founded the London Food Bank in 1986 and served as a volunteer director for 25 years. During that time, Mr. Pearson was also involved in numerous overseas humanitarian and development projects, including the establishment of an NGO in the Sudan in 1998 with his wife, Jane Roy, to help those trapped in slavery. Not content with establishing the slave redemption program, he and Jane adopted three children from Darfur who had lost their mother and been detained in slavery. Canadian Aid for Southern Sudan, another NGO created by Glenn Pearson and Jane Roy, with broader educational and humanitarian aims, was established in 2002. Glenn's approach to politics was unusually decent. He ran as a liberal candidate in the 2006 federal election in the riding of London Fanshawe. During the campaign, he refused to appear on a televised three-candidate panel unless the candidate from the Green Party was also invited. He did not win that election, and neither did the Green Party candidate. But when he ran again a year later in a by-election in London North Centre, Mr. Pearson did win. And he was followed in second place by Elizabeth May, leader of, yes, the Green Party. From 2006 to 2011, Mr. Pearson was a member of the federal parliament. He served in the shadow liberal cabinet as the official critic for international cooperation, as well as critic for the environment, and participated in several committees, including foreign affairs and international development and status of women. When he lost his seat in 2011, he was not alone among liberals. Yet his contribution to federal politics was not like many others. His blogs provided readers with everyday insights into life as a member of parliament and on the opposition backbench. Decently, he featured other London MPs representing other parties in his posts. Unlike many others in Ottawa, his aim was not to engage in partisan politics, but rather to be a public servant, working cooperatively for the greater good. Since 2011, Mr. Pearson has continued to contribute to global and local causes. He has also continued to contribute to public discourse as the author of numerous books and blog posts drawing on a myriad of topics close to his heart, including South Sudan, foreign aid, development, liberalism, citizenship, and, recently, capitalism and sustainability. He is the father of seven, grandfather of four, and role model for all. In closing, and in the words of one who nominated Mr. Pearson for this honor, in this often selfish world, his personal and professional activities have always focused on the needs of others. His selfless and mindful life is the example that our graduates should emulate to make this world a better place. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and in the name of the Senate, I ask you to confer the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa upon Glenn Pearson. By virtue of the authority vested in me as acting chancellor, I admit you to the degrees of Dr. Laws honoris causa. Congratulations, Dr. Pearson.
On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumnus, Dr. Glenn Pearson, to address convocation. Dr. Pearson. Dr. Pearson, it sounds a little odd to me, but I very, very much appreciate uh, the honor of this. This is a really important thing for my family. Sitting in front of me today is Margaret Roy, who in the year that I was born, 1950, graduated from this place, a real pioneer woman in a class that didn't have a lot of women in it. I was born that year, she made her mark that year and has been making her mark ever since. Now 91 years old, she came in her wheelchair to, to be with me. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Mr. Chancellor, President Chakma, members of the board and faculty of Western, friends and family of our graduates, and most important, me and you, the fellow graduates here today. It's great. It's awesome. This says something about Western. When Amit had called me in Quebec in February, I had just tried to go skiing with my kids. I'd had my stomach removed and I was on chemo and I couldn't ski. We got to the top of the hill at Tremblant. I had to ride, ride the uh, gondola back down to the bottom and I was feeling really sorry for myself. I was 63 years old and I could no longer ski and keep up with my kids. The phone rings, Glenn, it's Amit Chakma. We are proud to bestow a doctorate of laws on you. And in that moment, I suddenly realized I mattered. I mattered. I wasn't kind of riding off into some kind of sunset. I mattered. I mattered to my town. I mattered to my family. And I mattered to my world. But this says something about my family. My wife graduated from here. A number of my kids graduated from here. I've, uh, I've told you about my mother-in-law graduated from here. My three children from Sudan are all, whether they like it or not, going here. <laughs> They, they are here with me today as well. This says something about my family. Western runs through the blood here. The blood is purple in our family. But I was never included until today. Thank you. This says something about Western. It's what I love about Western. I was an MP for five years, and I represented the University of Western Ontario, now Western University, in the Parliament of Canada. And it was one of the greatest honors I could ever have there. By bestowing this honor on me, Western University is saying it's not just all about academia or expertise in those areas. It's about citizens that honestly feel that individuals can make a difference. That's why they've conferred that on me. Yes, I was in politics. Yes, I'm a father of seven. Yes, I was a firefighter. Yes, I started a food bank. Yes, I've worked in Sudan. But Western looked at me and said, he's just like others in the fact that he cares about his community. He cares about his world. And when Western, the great institution of Western University, can recognize someone like me, it doesn't say as much about me as it does about Western University. They've made their own moves into our community, into our world in recent years that have been staggering and have been wonderful. The fact that I'm recognized at Western is only fitting because I think Western has already made the move out into the world and towards this community, and I'm glad to be part of it. You know, if I had a theme today, it would be the knowledgeable individual, the need for the individual life to really matter. I'm tired. I, I was tired of it in Parliament to see a whole bunch of very, very intelligent people get into a room, take off the gloves, and bludgeon themselves. This is not what government is supposed to be. That's not what public service is supposed to be. Despite our differences, despite even the ways that we might look at how to run a country, we treat one another with respect because that's what knowledge does. It understands that the other people has, the other person has experience and knowledge that we must seek to get to the bottom of, seek to find and discover in order that we might find compromise for the greater good of our people. This says something about the individual life that I have been honored with here today. The, the real mark of wisdom, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, is to see the miraculous in the common. Folks, I've seen it all my 63 years. I've seen the most wonderful things, and it's been marvelous to see the average citizen step up and take leadership and make a difference. 
I've seen it over and over again. And listen, as Vaclav Havel once said, any fool can know, but the point is to understand. The problem that you face is that you have the knowledge, you have the training, and now you're ready to go out and get the experience. But if you don't understand, what was it for? There are people in Sudan today, for instance, that can't get water, that can't get an education. What you do matters to those people. The individual matters, and what you do individually, regardless of where you practice law, or regardless of how you work in the medical community, what you do as an individual matters to people like that. So when somebody comes up to me, as they did frequently in Parliament, to say that this is not really the age of the individual anymore, individuals really can't do anything in a world of globalization and other things, it just doesn't matter anymore. Later on, if you get the chance, meet my three kids. My three kids had a mother that was in slavery, was raped repeatedly, had three children as a result, and had to live in that confines for years. And then one day, as an individual, she decided to stand up for the sake of her own children, for the sake of her own people, and bolt. And she made a move with them, and she ran. And she got caught. She got killed. And as she died, I'm sure she was holding on to my one daughter, Abuk. I'm sure she was thinking of a Chan, her son, and, a, and a, her daughter, a Chan, and her son, a Ter, and wondering what would ever happen to them. And she died there thinking she had failed. A year later, we found Abuk, and we adopted her, and we brought her here. We were told that her brother and sister had been killed with the mother. Five years later, we took Abuk back to, Abuk back to her community. And there at the bottom of a staircase was a little girl that looked identical to her. It was a Chen, her twin sister. She'd survived. And only by the fact that they were identical did we figure out that something special had happened. And later that afternoon, a little boy came forward with a little blue flower. And it was a Chen's brother, a tear. It was a wonderful story. It was all over the media. It was absolutely fantastic. But that story would never have happened if that woman had not made it, the move she did. It's time that we start recognizing that the individual, even the graduate, is an individual, is the most powerful force. I kept saying in Parliament, and I keep saying it whenever I write, the most powerful office in the land is the individual citizen. The citizen can decide how they want to win, how they want to live. And if they choose not to take part in it, that's their own business but they have the right to replace office holders, to live the kind of life that they do. So this says something, I think, about the individual. The fact that I've been honored here amongst my peers, I know I look a lot older than you, but the fact that I've been honored here amongst my peers is Western saying the individual matters. But it says more than something about the individual, I believe it does say something about you. I asked when I first got elected if I could be on the Status of Woman Committee in Ottawa, and I was immediately told no. And when I asked why, it was because I was a man. After working in Sudan and fighting slavery and all those kind of things, I had to come back to my own federal government and being told I couldn't fight for women's causes on that committee. There was something wrong there. Fortunately, over time, they put me on that committee, and it was one of the greatest learning experiences that I had. You know, not too long ago, in writing in Jane Austen, it was said, a woman, especially if she have the fortune of knowing anything, should conceal it as well as she can. Nope, not anymore, not anymore. In Sudan and in so many places around the world, at the food bank and in other places up north with the Aboriginal communities, women are making the most incredible kind of differences. And it's time we acknowledged it not just by saying it and having plaudatory remarks, but by putting them into positions of leadership where they can make the kind of difference that matters. That's important. And we have to recognize that, that amongst the graduates that are here today, there are women that are about ready to change their world. And whatever field they go to, and my hat goes off to you, I know it has not been easy, and I know it was never easy for your mothers or your grandmothers, but you are here today to prove that the individual matters, and the individual woman is coming on strong and will make her difference in the world. You know, the people of Sudan, if they have one thing that they wish more than anything else, it's for an education for their children. 
They meet under trees. So Jane and I have been trying to build schools there to do whatever we can, but the number one thing is an education. The highest they can go is high school. But whenever Jane and I are there doing the work that we are doing, we continue to hear, if only I could send my child to university. Because there is no university there. To them, it's a dream. To you, the graduates today, you're living the dream. You're living the dream. These people are dying and trying to build a country so that they can have the privilege of what you have today. Please don't ever take what happens today and just start thinking of yourself. This isn't about a selfie. This isn't about all these other things that can be important to us in our lives. These things are ultimately about humanity and the difference that we are going to make. I don't have much more to say, but I do want to say this that when Jane and I were very, very fortunate a number of years ago when the South Sudan had a referendum as to whether it wanted to be its own nation, Jane and I were asked to be international observers for that. So was Jimmy Carter, and so was George Clooney. <laughs> for a few moments, my wife forgot her ma that she was married. <laughs> you know, I, I, I get that, and I don't blame her. But George Clooney then went down. He caught malaria and down he went. And then suddenly they brought in people like Jane and, and myself. And they said, can you go and see how real this democracy is? These are people that can't read or write. The only way that they can register their power or what they want is through putting ink on, a finger, on their fingertip and putting it onto a ballot. Could you go please and make sure that that process is valid and legitimate? And we said, yes, we would. And we took a team of people and we went up close to the border of Darfur. And that night we all slept in a campfire outside. And during the middle of the night, about two o'clock, I heard the sound of footsteps over and over and over again. And I, didn't know, and I couldn't sleep. So I asked, I got up, I asked one of the tribal chieftains, what's going on? He said, those people have been walking for two weeks for the privilege of coming here tomorrow to vote. Two weeks for the privilege of coming here to vote. The people of South Sudan voted. Of those people that could vote, 99% of them showed up. 99%. Of the 99% that showed up, 98% of them voted one way. Their nation. They wanted their own nation. They wanted to live their life in their own nation where they could make their own decisions and carry out their own lives. The sounds of those footsteps are some of the most haunting things I will ever remember. And as I lie in my waiting for my final breaths to take place, those footsteps will still haunt me. This was people struggling through without the privilege, without the dream that you and I have of being here today. These are people that have come forward to fight for just the right to live and make up their own minds and make up their own lives. Chief among them were the women of South Sudan and the mothers of South Sudan who pulled their communities together and made it work. Some people pursue meaning. Other people create it. And I'm looking at you today, and I'm looking at the creators. And I ask that you do it. I ask that you take what happens here today and get out there and make a difference in the world. Don't just live for your profession. Don't just live for your family. A number of years ago, the Free Press asked me, what was your greatest accomplishment in life? And they asked me that as my wife was sitting right in front of me. What would you say? I told the truth. The greatest accomplishment in my life is that I've kept the ideals of my youth. I'm 63 years old and I still believe I can change my world. I hope that the next sound of footsteps that I hear are yours. I hope as you come forward, you'll make that kind of concrete difference, make the difference in this world, live beyond yourself for the things that are beyond yourself. May those footsteps be yours. May they be yours.